for advanced study. I am Liz Cohn, and I am historian of 20th century United States and dean of the Radcliffe Institute. I'm delighted that you could join us today for what I am confident will be a terrific lecture by Larry Bartels titled, The Elusive Mandate, Searching for Meaning in Presidential Elections. I've heard Larry, who is now the May Worthen Shane Professor of Public Policy and Social Science at Vanderbilt University, speak on several occasions, and he always brings a provocative argument based on a wealth of data brilliantly analyzed to key political questions of the day. As we step back and search for meaning in the recent election results, I personally look forward to Larry's insights into the deeper significance of what happened on November 6th. <laughs> Though elusive mandate suggests we may be embarking on a rather challenging mission. This fall also saw a frenzy of activity, not only at the Radcliffe Institute, but in American society more broadly, as the nation went through its latest round of our civic ritual of presidential voting. This time, the pedantry uh, seemed at fever pitch, with both sides feeling that more was at stake than usual. In this match that was declared to be between the one and the 99%, the 47 and the rest, uh, Obama, care Obama caretakers and leavers, fiscal cliff dwellers and dreaders, gift givers and takers, or however one chose to characterize the sides this year. Now that the outcome has been decided and the journalists have moved on to other pressing stories, the election belongs to the scholars. First to political scientists like Larry Bartels and then eventually to my tribe, the historians. Today's lecture then is a good way to launch this next stage of deeper analysis. Larry Bartels has spent the last three decades considering what makes American voters tick and reminding us that often the answer is not what we have assumed. I would like now to turn the podium over to my colleague Rob Sampson, who will introduce Larry Bartels. Rob is the Director of Social Sciences at, in Academic Ventures a Program at the Radcliffe Institute and the Henry Ford II Professor of Social Sciences in the Sociology Department in Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Rob is also the director of the Boston Area Research Initiative, what we in-house here call BARI, a program sponsored by the Radcliffe Institute in collaboration with the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston and the City of Boston. This initiative is committed to strengthening research and teaching collaborations between the city and local colleges and universities, connecting scholars and their students, policymakers, and civic leaders around undertakings that improve the quality of scholarship for urban researchers and the quality of life for city residents. Rob's own work has made major contributions to our understanding of crime and deviance, the life course, neighborhood effects, and the social organization of cities, most notably in his recent book, Great American City, Chicago and the Enduring Neighborhood Effect. Rob. Thanks, Liz. Um, it's a great pleasure for me as director of the social sciences program here at Radcliffe to introduce uh, a little bit formally um, Larry Bartels. I think it's really wonderful timing as Liz alluded to. A mere three weeks after the presidential election, what could be more appropriate than hearing from one of America's leading experts on electoral politics, public opinion, and the role of citizens in the policymaking process? Who better to clear away the underbrush of punditry and contradictory analyses that we've heard so much of? And what does an electoral mandate really mean anyway? We shall soon find out, but first a little background. Larry is currently a professor of political science and the Shane Chair of Public Policy and Social Science at Vanderbilt, which he recently joined uh, just last year after teaching for some 20 years at Princeton University. And he began his career teaching in the political science department at University of Rochester. Larry received his PhD in political science from the University of California at Berkeley in 1983. He was awarded the BA magna cum laude with distinction in political scientist from a uh, college down the road in New Haven, Yale, and even as a, a sociologist, 
Um, I know that the political science department at Yale is, is really foundational to um, the study of government and, and politics. Larry's scholarly work focuses on American democracy, including public opinion, electoral politics, public policy, and representation. He is currently working on a book on democratic accountability, a study of the political attitudes and behavior of wealthy Americans. I'm curious to find out the results of that at some point. And a cross-sectional, I'm sorry, cross-national investigation of political responses uh, to the Great Recession, another timely topic, among other projects. His most recent book, Unequal Democracy, was cited by Barack Obama on the campaign trail in 2008 and appeared on David Leonhardt's list of economic books of the year in the New York Times. It also won the Gladys Kammerer Award for the year's best book on U.S. national policy. Other books include Campaign Reform, Insights and Evidence, edited with Lynn Vavrek, University of Michigan Press, the Presidential Primaries and the Dynamics of Public Choice, published by Princeton University Press. There are numerous and well-cited journal articles, I will just uh, pass over those. They're too numerous uh, to elucidate here. I just want to also note, however, that Larry has received many awards and uh, wide recognition. Just a sampling. He has served as vice president of the American Political Science Association, president of its political methodology section, chair of the board of overseers of the American National Election Studies, and founding director of the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, American Academy of Political and Social Science, and just recently was inducted into the National Academy of Sciences. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome up to the podium uh, Larry Bartels to deliver the Dean's annual social science lecture. Thank you for that. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm grateful to everyone at the Radcliffe Institute for their hospitality. My favorite moment so far in the day uh, came at lunchtime. One of the students who joined me for lunch asked what lessons I had drawn from the recent election. And um, after thinking for a moment, I said I couldn't think of any. Uh, so I hope that will dispense immediately with the idea that this is going to be a talk about the election that you've already heard a lot about and thought about. I want to emphasize the plural here, searching for meaning in presidential elections. And so what I really propose to do is to give you a kind of interim report on a career spent thinking about the American electoral process and what it means rather than about a particular election. And so I hope we can dispense quickly both with the idea that the 2012 election provided anyone with an impressive mandate, or for that matter, even with a slim mandate, and go on to talk about what I think is more interesting, which is the elusive mandate. There's a sampling here of announcements by various figures in the press, ranging from the more partisan to the more mainstream, all of which suggest that uh, Obama's reelection didn't amount to a mandate in any meaningful sense. I think I agree in one way or another with all of that, but what's more interesting is to think more basically about the idea of mandates themselves and what it would mean to have a mandate. So here's just a recent uh, bit from The Economist, uh, convoluted prose of a sort that's relatively uncommon in The Economist, but I think suits the complexity of the ideas here. Mandates aren't quite myths, but neither are they readily identifiable entities about which we can make confident assertions. The mandate is in the eye of the beholder. So when journalists and politicians weigh in on the subject, they're really psychoanalyzing the electorate writ large. So what I want to do is a bit of psychoanalyzing of the electorate writ large, uh, but not with the idea of stipulating that there uh, is a mandate of one kind or another for somebody or other as a result of this or any other election, but rather to try and suggest to you that the whole idea is so elusive as perhaps to be unhelpful. And I want to begin that discussion um, with a political scientist who, in my view, was the greatest political scientist of his era, uh, spent the end of his career at Harvard, a man named V.O. Key, Jr., who uh, did most of his own research in a period before systematic surveys of the electorate uh, were common. 
but lived through a revolution in political science in the 1950s in which the focus began to turn very heavily toward understanding of the behavior of individual voters based on systematic survey research. And toward the end of his career, he spent a great deal of time trying to figure out what sense he could make of all of that research that was piling up uh, across the country in political science studies of various kinds through the 1950s and early 1960s. And so his last book actually published posthumously was a book called The Responsible Electorate in which he attempted to try to make sense of the scholarship about electoral politics uh, of his entire career and especially of the last decade or so when so much scientific progress was being made. Um, much of this book consists only of tables of data analysis with brief notes that he had written to himself trying to explain how he was going to interpret the evidence or what points he wanted these tables to make. But he wrote out the concluding pages. He clearly had an idea here, uh, a strong, clear idea of what the message of the book was intended to be. And indeed, it's that message, I think, that has been most influential about this book rather than the actual analysis that he presented or uh, was working on presenting uh, at the time that he died. And so I want to violate the customs of lectures and simply recite to you the last page or so of that book. It begins with what I think is uh, almost certainly the most quoted single sentence of Key's entire career. He says, the perverse and unorthodox argument of this little book is that voters are not fools. And then he goes on to say, to be sure, many individual voters act in odd ways indeed. Yet in the large, the electorate behaves about as rationally and responsibly as we should expect given the clarity of the alternatives presented to it and the character of the information available to it. In American presidential campaigns of recent decades, the portrait of the American electorate that develops from the data is not one of an electorate straitjacketed by social determinants or moved by subconscious urges triggered by devilishly skillful propagandists. It is rather one of an electorate moved by concerns about central and relevant questions of public policy, of governmental performance, and of executive personality. Now what I want to do is to spend, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to read one more bit of this. This is the last uh, bit of the book. Propositions so uncompromisingly stated inevitably represent overstatements. Yet to the extent that they can be shown to resemble the reality, they are propositions of basic importance for both the theory and the practice of democracy. I think those are hugely important propositions. And so what I want to do today is to spend a little bit of time thinking about the subsequent political science literature and to try and gauge the extent to which it matches up with the uh, optimistic portrait of the electorate and the electoral process that he offered at the end of his career. So this is going to be a kind of opinionated uh, survey of the literature on American electoral politics in the half century since this book uh, was written. And what I want to do is to go point by point through the points that Key made in those last pages of the book and assess where we stand with respect to additional evidence since the period in which he was writing. And I want to start with the clarity of the alternatives and the character of information. Um, because Key was reacting to uh, a body of scholarly literature that emphasized the general impoverishment of political thought in a large proportion of the electorate and suggested that many people know the existence of few, if any, of the major issues of policy. That was an unhappy way to think about the American electorate, and so many of the scholars who came along in the wake of that research attempted to rescue uh, the American voter uh, by arguing that these were really not manifestations so much of any basic fundamental flaw in the electorate itself, but rather were manifestations of the unclarity of the alternatives or something about the specific political culture, especially the political culture of America in the 1950s, uh, low stakes, lots of uh, confused boundaries between the parties with respect to where they stood on particular issues and so forth, and that a different kind of political climate might produce a very different kind of American voter. Well, over the past three decades or so, we've seen big changes in the American political system, and especially a substantial polarization along partisan lines of the electorate in a way that simply wasn't the case in the 1950s. And so if what was wrong with the political culture of the 1950s was that 
people were being offered echoes that the party's positions weren't sufficiently clear and distinct, we now have a world in which it seems hard to argue that that's a, a problem with the political culture. Indeed, political scientists who had been campaigning for decades for a more responsible party system now have it and have spent most of their time lately coming up with uh, explanations for why it's such a bad thing, wringing their hands about it. But if we look at how voters have responded to this shift in the political culture, they have responded by becoming more partisan in lots of ways in terms of their expressed level of attachment to the parties, their attitudes about partisan figures. Uh, there are lots of ways in which they clearly are more partisan. But they don't seem to be, have become notably better informed or more systematic political thinkers. So the underlying psychology seems still to be very much similar to what it was in the days when these pioneering works were being turned out more than half a century ago. And I just want to provide a few examples that seem to me to, to make this point. This is a kind of long-term example based on data from the American National Election Studies. Since the early 1970s, they've been asking prospective voters to place the parties and their presidential candidates on an ideological scale. So here's a ideological scale running from one at the bottom, the most liberal position, up to extremely conservative, up at seven there at the top. And what I'm showing you is just the average placements of the Democratic and Republican presidential candidates in each election from 1972 through 2008. In some ways, the placement makes sense, right? The Democrats are always on the liberal side of the midpoint line. The Republicans are always on the conservative side of the midpoint line. But what seems most striking to me is how little variation there is across this series of elections in the way ordinary Americans saw the presidential candidates. Uh, they noticed certainly that George McGovern in 1972 was more liberal than most subsequent Democrats have been, or at least uh, they perceived him that way. But if you look at the rest of the Democratic candidates through this period, there seems to be very little variation in how the electorate saw them. And even more so on the Republican side, we go from uh, Richard Nixon to Gerald Ford uh, to Ronald Reagan to George H.W. Bush to Bob Dole to George W. Bush to John McCain. And from the voters' point of view, they're all essentially identical. In spite of everything that you, well-informed political observers, know about the really important differences among those different candidates with respect to their ideologies and their policy positions. Very little of that seems to have filtered down to the voters. And this whole process of partisan polarization, at least insofar as it involves ideology and the ideological separation of the parties that scholars have emphasized at the elite level, there's really no evidence at all of perceived ideological polarization here. We don't see the Republican candidates drifting sharply upward uh, as most elite observations about the political system would suggest. Here's another example that has to do with people's information uh, about significant policy changes that have actually occurred. This is a question that was asked in a survey last spring. Do you think the tax burden on middle class Americans has increased or decreased since Barack Obama became president? About 40% of the public said that it hadn't changed, another 40% or so said that it had increased a little or a lot, and a minority said that it had decreased, which of course is the correct answer. So uh, here's a president who's actually made a difference in people's lives in terms of changing the levels of taxes that they were paying, and for the vast majority of them, it seems to have escaped their attention. Here's the most momentous policy proposal that was actually passed by the House of Representatives in the last Congress and played an important role in the current campaign, especially when Paul Ryan was picked as the Republican vice presidential candidate. Under the budget proposed by Paul Ryan, federal spending on everything other than Medicare and Social Security would decline over the next 20 years, and then people were offered these four different descriptions of what the basic budgetary reality of American government is today and what it would look like if the plan that was passed by the House of Representatives actually took effect. The range of responses to that question was kind of uh, all over the board. The plural, the, the uh, modal response suggested that 22% uh, of GDP was being spent on government programs other than Medicare and Social Security and that that would fall to 14.5%. Um, in another version of this survey, 
Uh, I offered people the option of saying they don't know. Uh, as you can see, a lot of them were eager to take that option. Uh, but the proportions for the other four options were roughly similar to what they had been previously. And of course, the least selected option was the one that was actually correct. Uh, so the vast majority of people, if they're forced to guess, uh, guess that the American government is a great deal larger than it actually is, and underestimated the extent uh, to which the Ryan budget would uh, decimate uh, government spending if it was actually implemented. And if we turn our focus from the electorate as a whole to the set of people who are actually on the fence, uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot in the current campaign about how small the pool of undecided voters was through the course of the whole year. So here's a survey that focused on the 5% of the electorate that actually continued in the summer of 2012 to say that they were undecided about which candidate they would vote for. Uh, and you can see that most of those people didn't know that the Republicans controlled the House of Representatives. So they're trying to process arguments about what's gone on in American politics over the last couple of years and the extent to which the president has or hasn't uh, succeeded in passing the policies that he's talked about uh, without knowing that uh, the opposition party controls one of the two chambers of Congress. Well, all of that sounds bad from the point of view of thinking about the competence of the electorate, but political scientists in the last 20 years or so have come up with a more optimistic story that doesn't deny but largely evades the implications of those kinds of uh, pieces of evidence about how little ordinary voters seem to know about politics by stressing the idea of heuristics or gut rationality or information shortcuts. Different scholars have different uh, ideas about how to, to label this. But the basic idea is that people can use these shortcuts of one kind or another to make sensible decisions about politics, even if they don't know the details like which party controls Congress or what the Ryan budget would do. The uh, point here about Hispanic voters and eating the tamale is based on one of the most famous early examples of this kind of argument. Uh, Sam Popkin, in a book called The Reasoning Voter, referred to an episode when Gerald Ford was running against Ronald Reagan in the Republican presidential primaries in 1976, campaigning in Texas, and somebody handed him a tamale. And he tried to eat it without shucking it. Um, and Hopkins' point was that this was a signal that Hispanic voters could pick up on and make some judgment about whether Ford was likely to be their guy or not without knowing a lot about the details of his policy positions. But I've always found that example kind of perplexing because it's not at all clear to me whether they would have been correct to assume on the basis of Ford's familiarity with tamales uh, that he would or wouldn't be a better president than Ronald Reagan with respect to uh, satisfying whatever the substantive political interests of these Hispanic voters are. And so I think scholars have much too often gone from observing that people are using some kind of shortcut in making political decisions to assuming that somehow that's getting them closer to the right answer than they would otherwise be. Now it's difficult to figure out what the effects of these kinds of psychological processes are, but uh, insofar as we're able to figure out the extent to which people do succeed in voting as if they were fully informed on the basis of these kinds of shortcuts, perhaps not surprisingly, the evidence suggests that they don't, that some of these cues and heuristics can turn out to be helpful to some people in some circumstances, but that there's a real gulf between how people actually vote and how they would vote if they were fully informed using a variety of different uh, methods for trying to assess how they would in fact behave if they were better informed than they are. So I think this argument, although it's appealing on its face, probably doesn't get us as far as we'd like to think in terms of overcoming the problems of low information. The other part of the argument that is often made in this tradition is one that he alluded to just in passing in one of those passages that I read to you. He referred to the electorate in the large. And this is a point that subsequent scholars have seized upon, 
The basic idea actually is a very old one. It goes back to Condorcet in the 18th century, who pointed out that if a lot of people are independently making decisions, even if they're making the decisions with a lot of error, adding up their decisions could produce a collective outcome that was much more likely to be reliable and correct, uh, even though the individual decisions had a lot of error in them. That's a really elegant, I think, argument, but the problem with it is it only works if these individual errors are in fact independent. And if you think about what the political process is like, it seems to be a process that's really designed to produce errors that are not gonna be independent across all these voters. People don't sit in isolation and try and think about the political process in a way that's uh, unconnected to how everybody else is thinking about it. So if a candidate uh, has an especially good or bad performance in a debate, there isn't some alternative universe in which half the electorate is seeing a different debate in which the guy who had a good day actually had a bad day and vice versa. They're all seeing the same thing and being swayed insofar as they are swayed by these irrelevant factors uh, in the same direction. And so you wouldn't expect that these individual errors are going to cancel out across the electorate. And insofar as we've been able to study them systematically, it looks like they don't entirely. So again, a nice argument that doesn't seem as helpful on second look as it does on first look. Then Key went on to talk about subconscious urges and devilishly skillful propagandists. This, I think, is an indication of the sensitivity of scholars and many other observers in the 1950s to the possibility that elections would be taken over by, uh, by Madison Avenue, by the advertisers, as television became an important thing in political races. There was a lot of concern about the extent to which voters could be swayed by this kind of stuff. I think that concern was overstated, and perhaps for that reason, uh, the subject has largely dropped out of political science research subsequently. But there are some bits and pieces of evidence that I think are relevant uh, here and suggest that we ought not entirely to dismiss these kinds of concerns. One interesting line of evidence that began with psychologists but now includes a fair number of political scientists as well studies the ways in which people make judgments on the basis of very brief impressions of candidates. So in the original study of this sort, uh, people who didn't know either of the candidates in a senatorial race or a gubernatorial race in a different state were shown the pictures of the two candidates and flashed for less than a second uh, these two pictures and asked which one looked more competent. And it turned out that their judgments of the competence based simply on glancing at these pictures uh, were pretty predictive of the actual outcomes of the races. There's also been lots of work on the effect of television advertising, much more sophisticated and detailed than uh, the kind of work that would have been possible in Key's day. Um, in some sense, that work is reassuring. Most elections are not decided by who spends the most money on advertising. But there are important effects of advertising that we've been able to hone in on as our instrumentation has become more powerful and allowed us to observe relatively small effects. And one of the things I think is most interesting about that work is that it increasingly suggests that these advertising effects are very short-lived. If you expose somebody to an advertisement and then trace their voting intentions over a period of time, it looks like the effect of the ads wears off in a matter of a few days, um, which is consistent with the idea that the process of persuasion, insofar as there is one, is really not a very rational process, not grounded in learning. It's something that people are likely to be swayed by in an ephemeral way, and that the ads that really matter as a result are the ads that occur in the last week or so before the election, rather than the ads that occur much earlier in the process. Finally, um, Key emphasized a lot the fact that voters were voting on the basis of what he called central and relevant questions of public policy. And indeed, much of his own analysis in the book amounted to finding out that people who had some particular view about public policy cast a vote that was consistent with that view. And much of the subsequent political science literature has been of that same flavor. We ask people what they think about all kinds of policy issues, and then we correlate those uh, issue positions or preferences with their vote intentions or their vote behavior and find out that there's uh, a strong correlation. But the 
problem with that kind of analysis, which has been recognized uh, at least since the late 1960s or early 1970s, but hasn't really been fully integrated into this strand of research, is that that correlation between issue preferences and voting intentions can arise in a variety of ways. We'd like to think about a world in which people form views about the issues and then go out and vote on the basis of those issues. But insofar as we have evidence that allows us to separate out that explanation from others, it appears as though that's not mostly what's going on. And the example that I allude to here uh, is from a terrific work by Gabriel Lenz at Berkeley, uh, who had an article several years ago and now has a book that's just come out this year focusing on uh, the relationship between political candidates and voters and the way voters use issues in deciding how to vote. The example is from the 2000 presidential campaign where the issue of social security privatization was a big issue. In the last month or so of the campaign, much of the media coverage insofar as it focused on policy at all, focused on this policy issue, and a large fraction of the candidates' ads in the last few weeks of the campaign also focused on the issue of social security privatization, which George W. Bush favored and Al Gore opposed. If you look at the relationship between people's preferences on that issue and their voting intentions or their voting behavior, you see a correlation that increases over the course of the campaign in exactly the way that you would expect if people were deciding what they thought about this issue and then using that as a basis for choosing which candidate to vote for. But if you look at the data in more detail and look at when people decided what they thought about that issue in relation to when they decided who they were going to vote for, it turns out that the process was almost entirely the reverse. There were very few people who decided what they thought about the issue of Social Security privatization and then went out and voted for the guy who was uh, claiming to support the position that they now held, almost all of the change was of the opposite kind, that people who intended for some other reason to vote for Bush learned from all these ads and media coverage that Bush thought that Social Security privatization was a good thing, and so they came to support it as well. Or people who, for one reason or another, were going to vote for Al Gore learned that he thought this was a bad idea and so adopted for themselves the notion that this was a bad idea. So you might think that that's a good thing, that people now have this additional argument to bolster the decision that they were already going to make, but it really doesn't look as though they were voting on the basis of their views about this policy issue. Uh, and I think much the same argument holds for most other policy issues. Finally, Key's emphasis on governmental performance and executive personality. This is one where there's been a huge amount of additional work in the time since he wrote, and I think most of that work reinforces his idea that governmental performance is an extremely important factor in determining how people are going to vote. They're swayed by their perceptions of economic and social conditions under the incumbent administration, and I think elections can be interpreted in significant part as referenda on the executive performance of the incumbent government. The most famous instance of that kind of relationship is in presidential elections because they've been most studied and looks at the relationship between the incumbent party's performance in the election and some measure of economic uh, performance or income growth over the course of the election year. So here's an example of what that relationship looks like over the last 60 years. Um, you can see that there's a strong positive relationship between the rate of growth during the election year and the incumbent party's popular vote margin. The dotted line that I'm showing you in the figure here is the predicted margin for first term incumbents. That's an important point. The first term incumbents are the dark diamonds in this picture and the cases in which a president was running for re-election or in which uh, a new candidate was running for the incumbent party after they'd already been in power uh, for more than one term are the open circles. And you can see just by looking at the picture that there's a pretty distinct difference between the two, that uh, incumbent presidents running the first time uh, tend to do significantly better with the same level of economic performance than uh, situations where the incumbent is retiring and there's a successor candidate uh, running. You can also see that the 2012 election outcome, uh, insofar as I can gauge the election year change in real disposable personal income right now, obviously those data aren't quite complete and they'll be 
subject to some revision, but it looks as though the 2012 election was quite consistent with this typical relationship uh, for first-term incumbents running for re-election. Now, this pattern of what has been called retrospective voting seems to render political ignorance rather less troubling because it supposes that people are voting not on the basis of what they think about Social Security privatization or the Ryan budget plan, but rather simply based on their judgment about how things are going. And as uh, Mofi Arena wrote in his influential book about this uh, a few decades ago now, even uninformed citizens typically have one comparatively hard bit of data. They know what life has been like during the incumbent's administration. And so if what elections are about is translating this judgment about how things are going under the incumbent administration into a vote, then that's something that we might think that people can do pretty well uh, without being deeply informed about the details of public policy. But I want to suggest that retrospective voting is actually a good deal harder than it might seem, or than uh, Fiorina's little quote uh, would suggest it is. And there are really three kinds of complications that I want to point to briefly here. The first is that these perceptions of national conditions that voters are using to make their judgments turn out to be seriously skewed in a variety of ways, most obviously by partisan biases, but also by other kinds of biases and folk wisdoms that make it uh, hard for voters to gauge uh, how well things actually are going under the incumbent party. Secondly, that voters are what I'll call myopically focused on current conditions and mostly forget or ignore what happened in the past. And third, that voters have a lot of difficulty sensibly attributing political responsibility. Obviously, if things are bad for reasons that have nothing to do with the incumbent's performance, it doesn't make much sense to hold the incumbent responsible for that. Or similarly, if things are going well for reasons that don't have to do with the incumbent's performance. So just a, briefly a bit about each of those three. Um, Here's an example of the kinds of misperceptions that we observe in people's assessments of how things are going. This is a question asked in 1988 after eight years of Ronald Reagan's presidency. A pretty simple factual question. Has inflation increased or decreased during the time that Reagan has been president? The truth was that the inflation rate had gone from 13.5% to 4%. So you might think that this is something that a discerning citizen would have noticed. Uh, but in fact, uh, most strong Democrats said that inflation had increased during the time that Reagan was president. Now, you might think that that's a kind of absent-mindedness. Uh, but in fact, if you look at people's levels of political information, it turns out that these kinds of partisan biases in perceptions of basic objective facts about how things are in the world are actually, they tend to be strongest among people who are generally best informed about politics rather than the people who are not paying attention. And so the implication here is that paying a lot of attention to the political process, at least in the environment that we're in right now, mostly consists of learning the talking points on your side of the partisan divide and coming to see the world in the way that the pundits on your side and the politicians on your side would like you to see them. This isn't true just of Democrats. Of course, it's true of Republicans as well. The second point about myopia, Incumbents' fortunes at the polls depend on income growth in the year of the election, as I just showed you in that picture, uh, or even a fraction of the year. Actually, if you look at uh, quarter by quarter growth rates, it seems as though the best predictor of the president's re-election chances uh, is the level of income growth in the 14th and 15th quarters of his term, which is the middle of the election year. So what happens over that six-month period seems largely to drive uh, the president's re-election chances, rather than voters taking into account what's happened over the course of a president's entire term. People have tried to come up with rationalistic kinds of explanations for why that might be true in terms of voters' understanding of the underlying economic processes, but I think it's really hard to deny that it's a kind of strange focus uh, because there's a lot of random variation from month to month or from quarter to quarter in these economic numbers. And so gauging the performance of an incumbent over a small slice of that period rather than over a longer period of time um, seems quite clearly to be missing most of what we would want voters to hold incumbents responsible for. So here's just a comparison between, on the left, the same picture that I showed you. This is the relationship between growth in the election year and the incumbent's vote margin. 
and on the right, the same relationship, but focusing on cumulative income growth over the second and third and fourth years of the president's term, which is the period that I would argue would be most sensible if you thought the performance of the individual president was what you were trying to gauge. And you can see that the relationship on the right is much weaker statistically, lots of big outliers, especially some instances in which presidents performed really rather well over the long term, over their entire administration, but not very well in the short term, and as a result were booted out of office uh, in spite of having cumulative economic performance that would seem to warrant uh, winning re-election in a landslide. Maybe by chance, maybe by not, it happens that all of those cases in which incumbent parties were booted despite good long-term cumulative economic performance were instances of Democrats uh, losing to Republicans. And so it turns out that if you simply imagine a counterfactual in which voters weighed equally the incumbent party's growth rate performance over uh, three years rather than just one year, we would have had uh, three fewer Republican presidents than we've actually had in the post-war period. And here's an idea about uh, how that works. Uh, the picture on the left here traces the record of Democratic and Republican presidents in producing income growth for people in different parts of the income distribution, ranging from working poor people at the 20th percentile up to pretty affluent people at the 95th percentile of the income distribution. The dark line is for Democratic presidents and the dotted line is for Republican presidents. And you can see the big story there is that through this post-war period, uh, the middle class and especially the working poor have seen vastly more income growth under Democratic presidents than they have under Republican presidents. So why is it that Republicans keep getting reelected? Well, it's a complicated story, but I think a significant part of it is the picture on the right, which is the same calculation over the same period of time, but looking only at what's happened in presidential election years. And you can see that roughly the slopes of the two curves are similar in presidential years to what they are at other times, but the relative positions of the two curves are entirely reversed. And so, whereas everyone across the board has done better under Democratic presidents on average over the entire period, uh, everyone has done at least as well, and in some cases significantly better under Republican presidents during election years, which is when it actually matters to voters. This would not have been a surprise to Ostrogorsky, who more than a century ago described Americans as uh, of all the races in an advanced stage of civilization, the least accessible to long views. Always and everywhere in a hurry to get rich, he does not give a thought to remote consequences. He sees only present advantages. He does not remember, he does not feel. He lives in a materialist dream. And finally, the third problem that I want to point to with respect to retrospective voting is about the attribution of political responsibility. People can argue about how much of the current economic circumstance is either to be credited or blamed to Barack Obama, how much to George Bush, how much to Wall Street, all that is very complicated. Um, and so rather than trying to sort that out, it seemed to uh, me, and this is work that was done jointly with uh, my teacher and collaborator, Chris Aiken at Princeton, uh, to look for situations in which we could be pretty clear about whether or not the incumbent party ought to be blamed or rewarded for particular kinds of conditions. And so one of the things we did was to look at situations in which uh, parts of the country were experiencing droughts or floods at election time. Conveniently, the federal government has kept this data in a great deal of detail over more than a century. So we have a century's worth of data to average over in order to rule out the problem that any particular incident of a drought or flood might be unusual in some way. And it turns out that there's a pretty strong systematic relationship when things are too wet or too dry, uh, the incumbent party is punished at the polls. To give you some idea of the magnitude of that, in 2000, which was a year in which there was uh, somewhat more uh, negative weather situations uh, in different parts of the country than average, we estimate that about 2.8 million people voted against Al Gore because their states were too wet or too dry. Um, Another interesting instance is shark attacks off the coast of New Jersey in 1916. When Chris first visited for a year in Princeton, he got interested in this. This is the basis of the Jaws story, which was written by an author who lived in Princeton. But all of these shark attacks actually did happen 
conveniently for us as social scientists, just a few months before the 1916 presidential election in a state which was the home state of the incumbent president, Woodrow Wilson. And our estimate based on comparisons of vote changes between 1912 and 1916 in various parts of the state of New Jersey suggests that the areas that were affected by these shark attacks, uh, Wilson's vote declined by eight to 10 percentage points, which is about half the effect of the Great Depression in New Jersey to give you some basis of comparisons. Um, presumably people weren't calculating that uh, Woodrow Wilson should somehow have kept the sharks away, but nevertheless the economic distress that they suffered as a result of this series of incidents soured them on Wilson in a way that was uh, pretty striking. Well, you might say that that's something that people do uh, when they're not paying much attention, but that when we see them in moments of real crisis where it really matters, their economic well-being is at stake, they'll focus in and do a better job of assessing how things are going. Um, based on that kind of argument, Aiken and I have done some work looking at what happened in the Great Depression, focusing first on the United States, uh, in the midst of the Great Depression, FDR was reelected in a landslide in 1936. Almost invariably, scholars have attributed that uh, to the endorsement by the electorate of New Deal policies. Uh, our view is that uh, there's rather little evidence, actually, that it was Roosevelt's policies directly that mattered. There was no evident ideological sea change in the electorate in the 1930s. Mostly what happened was that people voted in the same way that they seemed to vote at other times. That is to say, rewarding the incumbent if things were going well and punishing the incumbent if things were going badly at the time of the election. I emphasize at the time of the election because even in these circumstances, people seemed not to pay any attention at all to economic records of the Roosevelt administration in 1934, 1935. He presided over, I think it was uh, about a 15% increase in uh, economic output during those two years. As best we can tell by analyzing the data, got no credit at all at the polls in 1936. But he did get credit at the polls for uh, election year income change in 1936. So here's another one of those scatter plots now looking across states comparing the states that experienced big booms in the economy in 1936 on the right and those that experienced uh, losses on the left. The magnitudes of the changes here are vastly larger than in contemporary elections, which makes it easier to see the effect that's going on, which is that Roosevelt is mostly gaining votes between 1932 and 1936 in the places where the economy is growing and losing places, uh, losing votes in the places where the economy uh, is shrinking. And so what seems to have been going on is really much more a referendum on the short-term performance of the economy than any kind of ideological sea change. And if we look at what happened in other parts of the world during the Depression, you get a similar kind of picture, which is to say no real consistency in terms of ideological movement, but lots of punishing of incumbents when things were going badly and lots of rewarding of incumbents when things started to look up. So you can point to places where voters elected liberals, places where they replaced liberals with conservatives, uh, places where they elected nationalists, uh, places where they replaced liberals with conservatives and then with socialists. If you compare the adjacent prairie provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta, you have one in which they elected a socialist and another in which they threw out the socialists who were already in power and replaced them with a wacky radio preacher. So the basic pattern here seems to be that any alternative is likely to be acceptable to voters in situations when times are tough. Um, more or less regardless of the ideology that they're propounding to get out of the crisis. And in many of these cases, as the country did grow out of the crisis over the course of the 1930s, the party that happened to be in power when things improved remained in power and had a, at least a rough uh, majority of the electorate for decades afterwards. So these kinds of effects, I think, can often uh, be quite long-lasting. And of course, in Germany, we have a situation where all the mainstream parties were discredited by a prolonged period of economic distress, and the voters gravitated toward the Poles, toward the communists and the Nazis. The Nazis won uh, substantial popular support, and not long after, the democratic process ended. Okay, well, I want to say a little bit 
about what I think is the most impressive successor to the responsible electorate thesis in contemporary political science, which is a book that was published uh, a decade ago now <clears throat> by Robert Erickson and Michael McCune and James Stimson called The Macro Polity. This is a really uh, ambitious and impressive piece of work in which they underline two points that I think are uh, quite strongly contradictory to the line that I've been taking here. One is to underline the extraordinary sophistication of the collective electorate, and the other is to, argue, to talk about the strong evidence that policies of national elites respond directly to small changes in public opinion. So on one hand, we have a sophisticated electorate, and on the other hand, we have politicians who are really sensitive and attuned to shifts in public opinion and respond with policy changes. I think their analysis is unconvincing in a couple of important respects. First, with respect to election outcomes. They talk about election outcomes as resulting from two things mostly. One is shifts in what they call macro partisanship, which is the basic balance of Democratic and Republican loyalties in the electorate. And the other is what they call policy mood, which is a general measure of people's sentiment to move in a more liberal or conservative direction with respect to domestic policy. Unfortunately, their analysis has, uh, I think, an important limitation. They say, <coughs> excuse me, they say themselves, our forecasting ability is limited until the month before the election, and it depends heavily on shifts in partisanship over the course of the election year, shifts which are volatile and essentially uncorrelated with the other variables of the model, which is to say, if we know at the time of the election whether people are Republicans or Democrats, we can do a pretty good job of predicting the election outcome, but we can't account for why there are more Democrats or Republicans at that point because things are shifting so much in the last six months or a year before the election. So I think given this limitation, it's probably not surprising that this big cottage industry that had already sprung up a decade ago and now is even more vibrant of trying to predict election outcomes on the basis of various kinds of statistical models have mostly, in fact, I think entirely uh, not relied at all on either macro partisanship or policy mood as an important explanatory variable. <coughs> Excuse me. The second part of their story that I want to call into question is about the policy changes that stem from shifts in the public's policy mood. If you imagine that there's this gradual shifting back and forth, left and right, of people's views about government and how extensive government programs should be, and that politicians are responding at the margin to those kinds of movements, that seems like a pretty happy story with respect to responsiveness and political representation. And that's really verbally the kind of story that the authors are telling. But if you look at the magnitudes of the effects that they're actually estimating in their analyses, it turns out that the policy effect of moving from the most conservative mood of the past half century to the most liberal mood of the past half century, the direct effect of that shift in public opinion, is a good deal smaller than the effect of simply shifting from a typical Democrat to a typical Republican or vice versa. So, there are big shifts to policy. Those shifts mostly have to do with which party controls the White House rather than with the movement of public opinion in the electorate. And so if election outcomes are being determined mostly by these idiosyncratic factors rather than by the policy views of the public, that's probably not such good news. Here's a similar kind of summary picture of the relationship between constituency opinion and policy choices now by members of the US Senate. Again, <clears throat> we're looking at constituency opinion in different states running from the most liberal on the left to the most conservative on the right, and the general liberal, liberal or conservative behavior of senators running from the most liberal at the bottom to the most conservative at the top. And you can see from the summary lines that I've drawn in here that there's a positive relationship between the two, so senators from more liberal states tend to behave in a more liberal way. Senators from a more conservative states tend to behave in a more conservative way. But that difference, moving, say, from the most conservative state in the country on the right to the most uh, liberal state in the country on the left, that expected change in the behavior of a senator is a good deal smaller than the difference 
that you'd expect in the behavior of a Democrat and a Republican representing constituents with similar ideological views. And in fact, in the period when these data were gathered in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there were a fair number of instances in which a single state had elected both a Democrat and a Republican. So they were representing exactly the same constituents, but behaving in vastly different ways. Again, I think underlining the significance of elections in terms of determining which person gets to sit in the seat and make the decisions, but also the limitations of elections in terms of directly representing public opinion as it would be summarized in a survey. So election outcomes have very significant and systematic policy consequences, but I'm forced to conclude that those election outcomes themselves are largely random, shaped much more by short-term income growth and other idiosyncratic factors than by what Key referred to as relevant questions of public policy, of governmental performance, and of executive personality. So why have elections at all? Um, one reason, I think, is that these largely random outcomes still provide some incentive for incumbents to do what they can at the margin to make voters better off, since that improves their chances of being reelected. Um, make voters better off has to be understood in the context that I put it, which is to say stuff that voters actually grasp that happens in the temporal proximity of the election. But there's something to be said for that, certainly. The tendency of voters to hold incumbents to higher standards the longer they've been in power. This harks back to the point I made about that first scatter plot picture in which the predicted line was for incumbents running for re-election the first time. I pointed out that the longer the incumbent party has been in power, the higher a standard they have to meet in order to have a good chance of being re-elected. I think that's, from the point of view of the process writ large, probably a convenient pattern. People get tired of the incumbent party after a while and are itchy to replace them. And as a result, it's very hard for one party to retain power over a long period of time, and thus like, less likely that they're gonna get so entrenched in office that the entire competitive process of electoral politics uh, is stymied in some important way. I think it's the case since the Civil War, there's only been one instance in American history in which a party won three successive presidential elections by as much as 10 percentage points. That was in the 1920s. And then the next decade, of course, uh, turned sharply to the, to the Democrats. So it's relatively common to have situations in which the partisan balance is more or less even, in which there's a fair amount of rotation of the parties in power. And of course, I haven't mentioned it here, but maybe uh, the most important reason to have elections is that it provides a useful convention for making decisions about who's going to wield power at any particular time. Even when we have very messy electoral processes as we did in 2000, uh, people get over it pretty quickly and agree on which side is gonna get to sit in the White House and, and make policy decisions. And certainly from the point of view of peace and tranquility, that's uh, an important uh, plus for the system that we have. But I wanna emphasize that it's a kind of useful convention like everyone deciding to drive on the right side of the road rather than uh, a mandate from on high from the people speaking with the voice of God. Propositions so uncompromisingly stated inevitably represent overstatements, yet to the extent that they can be shown to resemble the reality, they are propositions of basic importance for both the theory and the practice of democracy. Thank you. Thank you, wonderful talk. I'm Sarah Rodman, I'm a master's in liberal arts degree candidate. My question was you were talking about wet and dry years, and we had a very wet week before the election this year, yet Obama won. Would you care to comment on that? Um, I'm sure one of the things that political scientists will be trying to sort out in the months and years to come is whether the hurricane had any discernible impact on the election outcome. I think it's very difficult to tell. I think it's possible that it helped Obama. Uh, I'd have to see some systematic analysis to be convinced that that was the case. But remember, the point that I'm making is about circumstances on average rather than in a particular instance. And it is certainly the case that people are sensitive to the impressions that are formed about the quality of the response to a disaster as well as the disaster itself. And I think, generally speaking, people seem to give 
the president and the administration pretty high marks for their response to the hurricane. And so that part of it may have been helpful, even though the underlying condition uh, itself um, was a negative from the point of view of the president's reelection chances. And of course, in the longer term, the kinds of natural disasters that we're measuring in this analysis over the last century are uh, better represented by the drought uh, that affected most of the Midwest uh, in this year over the, much of the course of the year. And so there again, it may be possible to do some analysis that would tease out whether those drought conditions had any impact on the election outcome or not. I don't know for sure that they did, but the historical record would suggest that they probably were harmful to the president's chances. Hi, Jane Mansbridge, I teach at the Kennedy School. Um, so this is a terrific, was a terrific talk, and you've convinced us that democracy is the worst kind of government except for all the others. Um, uh, and uh, so, but I, and this takes you out of your, um, your field, so, but I wonder, among forms of democracy, do you have any, any guess as to whether any of the European systems, for example, does any better on any of the dimensions you're talking about, um, actual responsiveness uh, or informed public or any of these things? In other words, and I know that's not your field, you're an Americanist, but you might have been noticing over the years that I'm curious as to whether you think that there's another way of doing this that might produce better results. It's a complicated question because there were lots of varieties of better and it seems unlikely that any system is going to be preferable with respect to all of them. I think with respect to levels of information, there's a good deal of evidence suggesting that people in Europe are generally better informed than Americans are. It's hard to calibrate exactly because we have to ask questions that are in some sense equally salient to people in different parts of the world. Uh, but insofar as that's true, it's not obvious that it's really an effect of a different political system. I think it's really more a difference of culture or society. Um, with respect to political systems, I think the way to think about the difference between a plurality system like ours and a system of proportional representation is that they have different kinds of problems. Um, we have a lot of switching of governments that's generally less true in systems that have well-established multi-party systems. Um, the voting behavior of individual voters seems to be more stable across time actually in European systems than it is at least in the United States until fairly recently. I don't know what a recent uh, comparison would show, but often people are voting on the basis of social identities that are quite stable over a long period of time and so the same constellation of parties gets more or less the same level of support over time. That's partly an indication of the fact that voters can't figure out who to reward or blame for anything that's going well or going badly and so they don't vote as much on the basis of um, referendum considerations although they do certainly do a lot of that. Um, but the resulting policy pattern I think uh, in the two cases in the first past the post systems, you tend to observe a alternation between policies that are too far to the left and policies that are too far to the right from the median voters point of view. Whereas in European systems, you more often get policies that are relatively slow to change, but kind of chronically too far on one side or the other in ways that reflect either the existing pattern of coalitions and the power of the different parties in the coalitions or aspects of the political culture where elites across party lines tend to agree on something that's inconsistent with what voters in those systems say they want. So in terms of average distance between the median voter and policy, it looks from the little bit of systematic looking that I've done as though the two kinds of systems are generally pretty similar but fail in different ways. I'm Reg McKean of the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement, and uh, if Jenny's question asked about geographic variation, uh, I'll make this quick. I see a power of political scientists coming up behind me. Um, if Jenny's question was on geographic variation, I'd like to ask about temporal variation. Uh, uh, surely. Uh, Key's uh, studies from uh, in the 1950s, he was summing up uh, 
were based on a, the electorate of the 1950s, which had just, in the previous several decades, experienced the worst depression and the worst war in American history. Those things uh, must have concentrated the voters' minds, or considerably, uh, and there's been nothing like that since. So is it possible that the uh, voters of the last half century that you're summing up had a diff were therefore much less responsible, sophisticated, mature, knowledgeable than the voters that Key was summing up in his book? Thank you. I think the answer is no. It's obviously difficult to be very precise about this. The person who's behind you in line has done some of the most interesting work on comparing the psychology and behavior of voters across different uh, political eras. And the argument more often is that the voters of the 1950s were relatively unsystematic because the times were quiet and that when interesting politics came along in the 1960s, voters responded by becoming better organized in their thinking and better informed and so on. Um, if that was true, it was a relatively short-term kind of effect, I think. Uh, and the voters that we have now are in some ways quite different than either the voters of the 60s or the 70s. Perhaps most importantly, they seem to be a good deal more partisan uh, in their thinking about politics and in the way they think about candidates and issues. Uh, but in terms of the basic psychology, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of difference. The perhaps uh, tedious way of making this kind of argument was made in a book called The American Voter Revisited. The big classic study of voting behavior in the 1950s was a book published in 1960 called The American Voter. And this book called The American Voter Revisited, some of the people who had been graduate students of the guys who wrote the book in 1960 went back and reanalyzed data from recent presidential campaigns using exactly the same layout as in the original book. So they replicated the same tables, uh, but with recent data, and concluded that the behavior of the American voter really was very similar to what it had been in the 1950s. I'm Sandy Jenks. I teach at the Kennedy School. Um, when you talked about um, the problem that politicians are more to the left or the right than the people, than the median of the people they represent. Um, I took it that the democratic ideal would somehow be that uh, they should be closer to the center as in the 1950s. And I'm thinking to myself as, you, as I think about that, well, how would we ever learn anything? That is, if um, recent elections are about whether you want more government or less government, and you settle for a position right in the middle year after year after year after year, you'll never find out whether you want more or less government. You'll only have people dissatisfied on both sides, won't you? Um, I think that argument works better for some kinds of issues than others in situations where it's possible to A, experiment and maybe more unlikely, B, actually discern what the impact of the experiment was. Uh, you might imagine that we could learn significantly from experimentation in policy. It's not obvious to me that that would imply wholesale shifts to the left or wholesale shifts to the right. Maybe you'd want experimentation with respect to specific policies and then some analysis of whether or not they had worked by some standards that people across the spectrum could agree on. I think there's some but relatively little of that. And of course, with respect to policies that are much harder to reverse, I think it's harder to make the argument that we want to try something and see how it goes. Professor Berba. Uh, you can call me Sid. Uh, I uh, teach or taught in the government department at Harvard for a number of years, uh, recently retired, uh, and feel about the American political system uh, sort of as Jenny does, that it's pretty, it's pretty bad, but it's at least better than most other possibilities, uh, but nevertheless worry very much about the nature of our electoral system and where it's moving. And your analysis is gripping in terms of how thorough it is, in terms of the problems one finds in the American public. 
But at the end, you talked about the elites and what they do. And I was thinking that one of the problems is that whenever one thinks about what you could do about the American public, it's very hard to figure out what it is. You talk about having better civic education. It takes a long time and it doesn't seem to work. You talk about the media. People talk about the media, but they're only getting worse. And so one thinks about, could one do anything uh, about the elites? Uh, who obviously are playing part of this game. So I had the following question. Uh, one of the things that you could do, personally, uh, would it be good if the elites didn't read your book? Um, I, don't, I don't think there's anything in here that elites are gonna be shocked by. I think people who are successful politicians over long periods of time basically come to workable understandings about how the electorate is. I think if this does turn out to be a book and if people read it, it might scrape some of the sheen off of their talk about what the result of elections mean. I think that probably on average would be a good thing rather than a bad thing, although I'm not entirely sure. But I agree with you that the way elites behave is an important part of this story. Much of my argument is that they're less harness to the engine of public opinion than we would like to think. And so that raises the stakes for understanding what they do and why they do it. And I think there have been important shifts in elite political culture that are complex and I know less about them than many of the people in this room probably. Uh, but I would summarize them by saying that many of the conventional restraints on elite behavior that were well accepted more or less across the board half a century ago have eroded in one way or another and that elites now feel more freedom to accomplish whatever they can accomplish in support of their ideological goals uh, in ways that they probably would have considered to be beyond the pale uh, 50 years ago. But I think it's also worth noting that the benchmark baseline period here of 50 years ago is one that's comfortable to political scientists of a certain age, but really pretty uncharacteristic of American history more generally. If we think about the natural way politics should work as being the middle of the 20th century, um, we're probably obscuring the fact that the politics we have now is a good deal more similar to what we had in much of the 19th century, for example. Hello, I'm Paul Peterson, and I teach in the government department as well. and. Um, I ask my students to uh, read the textbook that I write with Morris Fiorina, so I feel uh, incumbent upon, it's incumbent upon me to say a, a word or two on his behalf. Um, I, I do think that you have done a very superb job of restating the, in bringing up to date the thesis that uh, was advanced in the American voter uh, back in the 1950s. And I do think you've addressed one of the central issues in the study of American politics and American government. Just how does a democracy work? How does it function? And I think the major uh, response to the position you've uh, outlined so effectively is the retrospective voting position. And uh, so it, focusing in on that specifically, um, you're, Argument against it is that voters are myopic and only look at the last six months or maybe the last year. And you presented some, some uh, regression lines to suggest that that's more important than the performance over the entire term. But the number of observations that one has is very limited. We mainly work with data since 1945. And so the error term in all of these models uh, is, is fairly large. And uh, you, you really quite don't quite know what might happen if you, if you, if you found that uh, that uh, entire term was a disaster except for the last three weeks or the last three months. But you sort of suspect that it, it probably wouldn't work. So I, I'm just wondering whether or not, uh, or to put it very precisely, um, isn't the error term large enough to make you wonder whether you have in fact got 
the myopic voter correctly labeled? Well, there's certainly a lot of uncertainty in these kinds of analyses given the limitations of the data. That particular point, I think, it comes out so strongly from the data that it's statistically significant by all the usual standards. So I think that one is probably not one that's likely to be overturned. And there are instances that come pretty close to the circumstance that you described. Maybe the most impressive one is Ronald Reagan's reelection. We think of Reagan as having been an economically successful president. He was mostly successful in presiding over a lot of economic growth during 1984. In fact, there was more economic growth in 1984 than there was in the first three years of his administration, and almost as much growth in 1984 as there was in his entire second term. And so the idea that he was an economically successful president, I think, largely rests on the fact that people's impressions were so strongly shaped by what went on in 1984 and by the specific character of the 1984 campaign that he ran, which had lots of good music and morning in America uh, and really helped to solidify the idea that he somehow was responsible for the economic recovery that the country had experienced. But more generally, if you imagine that the pattern was that voters were voting on the basis of how things had gone over the last three years rather than the last six months, it's not obvious to me that that would be a substantially happier story because obviously there are a lot of things that account for performance over a three-year period as well that are outside the president's control. And so this simple-minded kind of rule, I think, is likely to work better the longer the period you apply it to, but even at its best, it's likely to make a lot of type one and type two errors. And from the point of view of political accountability, I think the important implication of that is not just that voters sometimes get it wrong, but that the closer the election outcome is to a random event, the less incentive there is for incumbents to do whatever they can do to make people better off. Obviously, if their actions at the margin are gonna be swamped by shark attacks and droughts and short-term economic fluctuations, there's less incentive for them to trade off whatever their ideological hopes and wishes are against the kinds of policies that might actually make some substantial identifiable difference in people's lives. Hey, I'm Miera Levinson. I'm an associate professor at the um, Graduate School of Education here. And I have a sort of two-part question that combines the concerns of Professor Verba and Professor Mansbridge. I'm, uh, Curious thinking comparatively, so Professor Mansbridge brought up say, other countries, but one could also think more locally and whether, say, voters demonstrate that they are more knowledgeable about representatives, governors, city councilors, et cetera. Um, and if so, so, then I was thinking about with Professor Verbus, all right, so what are the implications of your argument? What should we do? And one possibility, I'm curious if there is data showing that voters are more informed, uh, more knowledgeable, and better able to vote uh, in their interests at the more local level, that then made me think, well, then maybe that's an argument actually for increased federalism, for reducing the power of the, fe the, you know, the national government and bringing democracy back closer to home. And or if there is not data in that regard, or if we don't, just don't know, I was thinking, so my field is civic education. I've been promoting um, civic education for a long time, and it made me think, well, there's this split between those advocating increased civic knowledge and those advocating skills and action civics. And so one possibility is we really need to fight the knowledge fight. The other possibility is say, it doesn't matter how hard you fight the knowledge fight, civic knowledge just isn't going to permeate the voter. Um, and so then it really is screw knowledge, and, and really start focusing on getting um, young people and you know, citizens involved in other forms of engagement or besides voting in addition to voting, is again, back sort of to the local things, thinking about knowledge. So when I was thinking about the implications of your argument, I was wondering, is there data supporting either reducing the power of the federal government because people know more locally and or trying any kinds of interventions with citizens, either to get them to know more or get them involved more where they actually know something already? Uh, <clears throat> I think the factual answer to the first part of the question is that it's exactly the reverse, that people seem to know a lot less about local politics than they do about national politics. I think that's partly probably a 
relatively recent phenomenon that reflects mobility and the erosion of the local media and their resources to be able to keep people informed about what's going on with respect to local politics. But I think it's also part of this broader problem that ordinary people, unlike the people in this room, have lots of other concerns that are much more important and pressing to them than politics is. They're distracted by lots of other things. And so insofar as national politics is a big deal, at least every four years, it penetrates some into their consciousness. But for most people, it's not a a day-to-day -day kind of thing. The broader reaction I have to your question, I, though, I guess, is that I'm um, not convinced that increasing the voter's level of information, somehow figuring out how to dose them with more facts, is really going to be the solution to this problem. Early in my career, I spent a great deal of time writing about political interests and thinking about how we could somehow impute preferences to people that would reflect how they would behave if they were better informed than they actually were, um, and wrote a long, never published piece about this. And the reason that I lost faith in it has largely to do with this pattern of findings that I tried to describe to you, that what increased attention to politics and information about t politics mostly seems to measure is the extent to which people have absorbed the political arguments on their own side of the spectrum. And so you see, on one hand, people better able to talk about the issues that distinguish the candidates and stuff like that. But on the other hand, to be susceptible to these massive misperceptions about basic facts about the world because they're inconvenient for the people on their side. Frank Dobbin, <coughs> pardon me, sociology. Uh, part of the story you told is about um, the dysfunctionality of the current system. And it seems to be based on the idea that people are not voting their actual political preferences. They see somebody and they like the way they look and they vote for that person. Or they, they choose a person and then they change their political attitudes to be in conformity with the person's political attitudes. But you could think about the political system as doing something different, as producing a leader that people can get behind and can, be, can feel good about. And certainly if you look at people being interviewed on television about their opinions about the candidates, a lot of what you hear is warmth or a feeling that this person will lead us in the right direction. Um, and if, if you think about the last election, what happened was one of the candidates didn't really take any po political positions. That is, Romney refused to take political positions, even when pressed, on lots of different issues. He wouldn't say how he was going to close the, the um, budget gap. He, he wouldn't really say how he felt about abortion. He changed or he took no opinion at all. And he lost, but he did really well for somebody who didn't take any opinions at all. So Why would you think it would be a disadvantage to not take, take <coughs> opinions? Well, I mean, if, you're think, if, if, if how we're thinking about it is you take an opinion and then you draw the people who hold that opinion to you, um, yeah, well, it's, obviously it wasn't much of a disadvantage. Um, but it, it certainly isn't in keeping with our view that people hold uh, political views prior to making, uh, to making choices of candidates, and then they go to the person who, they, who, mo who best reflects their views. So I, I wonder if we should be thinking about the political system as, as more variegated and as people's preferences as, in some cases, oriented to issues, but in many cases, especially for the people in the middle of the electorate, as oriented to leadership and personality. I think there and is some of that. Okay, I think it's I more leadership than personality in the sense that these observable, plausibly relevant measures of how the country is going, or at least of people's perceptions of how the country is going, seems to matter more than the personal assessments of individual politicians, which are themselves strongly colored by partisanship and by the state of the economy, whether the president is presiding over good times or bad times. So I think personality is a factor, but a relatively modest factor in and of itself. But certainly there's a range of things that people are voting on, as you suggest, which makes it much harder to come to any general conclusion about what the meaning of the election would be. But you might think about what are the kinds of shortcuts that would be most relevant and useful to people insofar as they're going to operate on the basis of shortcuts. I think in the current 
political environment, probably the most efficient one is for them to be able to figure out successfully whether they ought to be Republicans or Democrats, because so much seems to follow from that right now in terms of the likely behavior of elected officials. We certainly see people voting a lot on the basis of partisanship. So if they have the right party identification, that's probably a sign that they're doing pretty well. But we don't really know what the basis of their party identification ought to be in some platonic sense. And so it's hard to know how to evaluate that. The one other thing I would say is you're talking about the extent to which favorable impressions of the politicians then can be a resource for them to govern effectively after the election. Um, one of the pessimistic footnotes of this literature on increasing partisan polarization, increasing uh, dispersion in the partisan attitudes of people across the spectrum is that the shifts seem mostly to have been not in terms of people coming to feel more enthusiastic about their own party and its candidates, but rather to feel even less enthusiastic about the other party and its candidates. So much of the increasing divergence has come on the downside rather than on the upside. My name is Marylise, and um, prior to the Radcliffe Institute, I am a Radcliffe alumna. Um, I don't have the credential of some of the previous questioners, but I am an American voter. Um, I'm curious, given our two-party system, it's understandable that most of your analysis related to Democrats and Republicans, and you just talked in your last answer about identifying with one or the other, but we've had years during that, those same periods of candidates like John Anderson and Ross Perot and Ralph Nader, and I'm wondering what relevance their campaigns had um, on the American electorate and the results of, of your studies? Um, mostly I would say not much. There are some instances in which they've created mischief of one kind or another by splitting up the vote on one side in a way that elected a candidate who was arguably not uh, likely to have been preferred by a majority of Americans or of American voters, if you think that's an important consideration insofar as they've been politically consequential, and I think this is true of third parties throughout American history, it's mostly been by raising issues that then the major parties felt somehow obligated to address in one way or another. And so the third party candidates who've been kind of personalistic vanity candidates, I think have had relatively less effect than the ones who have tried to build some kind of movement based around a particular policy concern or a particular kind of political issue that then got absorbed into the mainstream of the two-party system in some way. Please join me in thanking Larry Bartels Thank for you. his lecture.